Hello, what's up everyone? Welcome to this live stream where we are going to learn how to implement our first simple yet useful Swift macro. First thing before we start, for the first time, I'm not streaming only to YouTube, but I'm actually also streaming to Twitter and LinkedIn simultaneously. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully the technical part uh, is going to follow and uh, it's not going to crash and burn. But if you see me being a bit worried, it's probably because I'm looking at the numbers to make sure that uh, everything is working. So as I was saying, we're going to learn how to implement a first Swift UI macro. And the reason why this is going to be a full live stream and not just uh, a regular video is because implementing a macro is actually quite, uh, quite a complex process. Maybe you've tried before and if you've tried, you probably seen that it's complex. I would even go as far as to say that it's a bit, uh, a bit daunting because to take um, a comparison, implementing a property wrapper or even uh, a result builder is a challenge, but it's something that's doable. Uh, you can read a tutorial and in 10, 15 minutes, you can get a first simple property wrapper or result builder working. With macros, it's really, really different. That's why I wanted to do a, a live stream to be able to go over this side, uh, not side by side, uh, step by step rather. As I was saying, there are so many reasons I could be a bit distracted on the technical end. But I'm seeing messages from YouTube in the chat. So hello, Tom Appmaker. Hello, Yuri. Nice to see you. Hello, Patamesh. Nice to see you. It's been a long time. So I'm glad to see that the technical part seems to be working. So let's actually uh, get started. Let's get at it. So if uh, you've never tried to create a macro in uh, Xcode, well, the first step is to actually create a project. And not exactly a project, but rather a Swift package. When I was telling you that creating a macro is a bit uh, complex, like the very first step of how you create the macro is already not straightforward. So what you will want to do in Xcode is to do file, new, and package. So file, new package. It's not something that we do uh, that often. To be honest, before doing uh, creating macros, I think I had never, uh, never done it uh, before. But this is how you create a macro. And we're going to see why macros live in their own package uh, just a bit after. So when you've clicked on this, then you get the window that was displayed since the beginning. And so you have to choose a template for a new package and here, sorry. And here we're going to choose a template Swift macro and then hit next. Then we need to give it a name. So I'm going to call it URL macro because I don't know if I mentioned it, but we're going to implement a macro that takes as an argument a string and that's going to trigger a compile time error if that string doesn't parse into a URL. So to say it more simply, if the string isn't a valid URL, then we're going to, ha to have a compile error or rather than having a nil uh, at the execution at runtime. And then either it will be properly handled or not. But anyway, we will, we will already be too late because users will have to deal with code being shipped on their device that couldn't, um, that couldn't parse a static string into, a, um, into, a, into an actual URL. So we're going to call the, the package URL macro. I'm going to put it on my desktop and I'm not going to add it into any project or workspace, but if you create your macro from within a project, then you will want to add it uh, to one or several of the, of the targets of your project. So I'm going to hit create. And you can see that it's creating uh, quite a few things. It's also pulling a, a package, a package called Swift syntax. So let's go over it side, uh, step by, once again, I was about to say side by side, step by step. <laughs> so this package that it's importing Swift syntax, it's a library made by the Swift team that allows you to handle the Swift syntax. We're gonna go into this uh, in more details, but at a high level, a macro, it operates on Swift code, but on Swift code, it has already been parsed into a structure that is called the abstract syntax tree. And in order to manipulate this abstract syntax tree, you need to have uh, the right types being defined. And so this is the, the job of Swift syntax to offer, 
to offer well the types, the tools to handle part Swift code. This is also the package where you can find uh, a lot of example macros that were implemented by the Swift team. And actually the code for the URL macros we're going to write, uh, I took it from these examples and I put the link to these examples in the description of the live stream on, uh, on YouTube if you want to check it. Now let's have a look at what was actually created. So we've created a package. So we have a package.swift file. You can see we have two products, a library and an executable. We're going to go over it over them uh, just after. We have a dependency, so Swift syntax, what we've just covered. And then we have some targets. So we have a package of type macro. We have a, another target, target that is more classical. So it's what exposes the macro as part of its API, which is used in client programs. We're going to see what it is just after. Uh, we have an executable target. We'll see why we need to have also this. And finally, we have a test target. So we have uh, no less than four different targets. One macro target, one regular target, one executable target, and uh, finally, one test target. When I was telling you that it can be quite daunting uh, when you create your first macro and you're faced with this and you need to understand uh, what's happening. So let's take a look at what's been created. In the sources, we have so in source in the sources we have three directories, which are each for one of the targets, and one more directory in test. So we have our our four uh, targets here. So let's start with URL macro. URL macro. So I didn't mention it, but when you create a macro for the first time, uh, Xcode in the template, it puts the stringify macro, which is a macro that takes an expression and produces, and produces a tuple which contains on the first member the expression itself. And so it's result evaluated when you run the code. And on the second member, a string reflecting uh, what was the code of the expression. They put this so that you have the architecture in place. And they also put this example because it's probably the most simple example of something that cannot be implemented uh, without a macro. So first, we're going to see how it's implemented, how this stringify example is implemented, and then we will implement our own example. So this first target, it's the API of the macro, meaning that it's what uh, projects that use your macro are going to import. So we can see that the macro is declared with uh, the keyword macro. So as we declare a function with func, a struct with struct, a class with class, etc., etc., we declare a macro with a new keyword macro. So that makes uh, that makes total sense. By the way, I'm going to split this across uh, several lines. Uh, how can I do it? Maybe like this, like this also. Yeah, this way it will be easier to uh, to see it. And I'm sure that I'm not hiding part of the code mistakenly. So we have a macro. We can see its signature. So it's called stringify. It takes a value of arbitrary type. So we pass in an expression that returns something, and it can be any type whatsoever. And we return, and we, the macro stringify, returns a tuple, which in its first element uh, contains an expression of type T, so the same type than the expression that was passed as an argument. And as its second uh, member of the tuple, returns a string. So it will be the code of the expression turned into a string. So that's, uh, that's quite uh, an interesting signature. But still, for now, uh, we are still in the, in the familiar realm with this part. Because you change macro by func, and you have something that is very similar to any function declaration in Swift. But it gets a bit more complex when we look at what is before and after the declaration. So let's start with before. We can see that the macro is annotated with at freestanding and then expression. So this annotation, it tells us what is the role of the macro. So a macro can have several roles, meaning that it can per perform several tasks. And macros are split into two categories. On the one hand, you have the freestanding macros, like this one. So they are the one that you call by using an hashtag or a pound uh, sign. And they are called freestanding because they are used, uh, they are standing freely in your code. They are not attached to something else. And the other kind of macros are attached macros. They're the one that you use with an at sign and they are called 
attached because you will attach them to an existing declaration. Think, for instance, a macro that you would attach to a struct and then it would generate new members for the struct. And freestanding macros, you have two kinds of them. You have expression freestanding macros, meaning that it's a macro that will produce an expression. So when the macro is evaluated, the new code that is going to generate is expected to contain an expression. And the other possibility would be to have a declaration and it's a macro that would, uh, that the, it's the macro for which the code it produces would produce a declaration instead of an expression. An example of a freestanding declaration macro that you have in the videos from Apple of last year's WDC is uh, an example where they have a macro that creates a struct to handle an n-dimensional array. That's the, typical, uh, that's the typical example for a declaration macro. So here we have an expression macro in the sense that when we call this macro, it returns an expression and this expression is of the return type of the function. So we've covered this part. Now let's cover what's after. So we have this equal sign and then we have this pound external macro. So this is what allows us to link the public interface of the macro here selected with its implementation. This might seem a bit weird when you've only done Swift because Swift is a language where you don't have a difference between a header file and an implementation file. Everything is implemented into Swift files and then the compiler is able to automatically generate the header for you uh, and it does it by just applying the rules that you define uh, with what is public, what is private, etc., etc. If you've done, uh, for instance, Objective-C in the past, you might remember that in Objective-C, we did have .h files, which were the headers, and .m file, which were the implementation file. It's the exact same logic. For a macro, you need to have the header on one hand and the implementation on the other hand. There are two reasons for this. The first one is about security, because since a macro is going to run at compile time as part of the compilation process, you, you don't want the macro to steal information that it shouldn't have access to, because you need to think that when you are compiling your code, there is some potentially private information laying around, like private keys maybe, um, API keys, the kind of stuff that you don't want to leak anywhere. And if macros were not handled with some amount of safety, um, it will be possible for a malicious macro to maybe retrieve this information from the computation process. But in order to make macros safe, macros are run into a process of their own. And so that's one of the reasons why macros have their own implementation file that sits, we're going to see that just after, that sits into a separate Swift package. And so there is a clear declaration between what you use in your code and how the macro is implemented. And it makes it uh, easier uh, to run the macro with a high level of safety. And the other one is that as we're going to see, the macro uh, is less strongly typed than uh, this interface is. We want our Swift code to be strongly typed, but macros, because they operate on a slightly different level, they have a bit more leeway. And so that's also one of the reasons why the implementation of a macro is different than its uh, declaration. By the way, bear in mind that macros are a very complex topic that is much closer to a compiler level than app level. Uh, I don't pretend to be a, an expert on macros, so when I say stuff, it's possible that maybe I'm simplifying something or maybe even making a big or why not a large mistake. So please take this expression with a grain of salt. Uh, I don't guarantee that I have the full picture here given the, the really high complexity of this topic. And so we can see that the implementation of the macro is supposed to be into a module called URL macro macros and a type called stringify macro. So we can see that it's the target that is here. So let's just have a look. What do we find in this file? So this is where the, the complexity is really going to hit because this is where the macro is implemented. And even though it's a very simple macro, we'll see that there is still a good amount of complexity. Um, so we are here in the implementation of the macro and we can see that here we have stringify, stringify macro. So that's the type that implements the macro. So we can see it's a struct 
that conforms to the protocol expression macro. So it's a protocol you have to implement in order to, uh, to define an expression macro. Remember that expression macro is the role that was defined for the macro just here. And in this protocol, you have one method. It's a static method, which is called expansion of node in context, and it returns an expression syntax. So this feels quite complex, but we're going to go at it, at it step by side, step by, I'm about to say step by side, step by step. I think I'm a bit tired and my mind focuses on saying step by step uh, the wrong way. So what are the arguments? First, we have a node. What's a node? A node is uh, the part of Swift code uh, on which the macro has been uh, applied. Or rather, it's the part of Swift code where the macro is used. So for instance, here, the node will contain this Swift code, but being parsed into the abstract syntax tree, which we're going to go into more detail just after. Then we have the context, and the context, it's uh, what allows the macro to interact with the compilation uh, process. Remember, I was saying that the, the implementation of a macro runs uh, isolated, which is a good thing for safety, but Sometimes it can be uh, limiting because it's possible that a macro needs some information that it cannot get when it only looks at the portion of code that has been applied to. An example of this is imagine that your macro needs to declare a local variable. You need to make sure that the macro uses an, an identifier that is not used anywhere else in the code. Otherwise, you would have a, a runtime error. And so that's one of the things that the context can do. The context, as a method, for instance, make unique name. You can give it uh, a basis to use, but this method you can call on the context is guaranteed to return to you an, an identifier that will be unique at the place uh, in code where you've called it. So that's very useful if you want to create a local variable with a name that won't conflict with something that already exists, or if you want to return a precise error uh, to, the to the compilation process, you can also do it by calling the method diagnose, which will produce, uh, uh, a, which will create a diagnostic, which will be reflected into a compile time error um, for the for the code that uses the macro. Let me go back to what we had just before. Uh, so I was there. Um, this method, you can see that it can throw. It's not mandatory, but it can also throw. And it's another way to report uh, errors. And we're going to do it a lot when we implement the URL macro. But another way to report an error is just to throw an error. And it also gets interpreted into a compilation error. But by calling a, a method on the context, you're able to add some additional information, like, for instance, on which part of the source code did the error happen, uh, maybe provide a quick fix for the user to fix it if it makes sense, this kind of stuff. And then finally, the macro, uh, the macro rather the function expansion that implements the macro returns an exp syntax, which is a type that represents an expression into the abstract syntax tree. So the macro is supposed to produce some new Swift code, but it cannot produce any kind of Swift code. It can only produce an expression because remember, it's an expression macro. I said we're going to have a look at what the abstract syntax tree is, so let's do it. Let's take a look at what the abstract syntax tree looks like for a call of the macro. So to have a look at the abstract syntax tree, you can use this website called swift-ast-explorer.com. It's a website uh, implemented by the Swift team. And what you can do is that on the left, you can parse some Swift code. And on the right, it will show you what it looks like once it's been parsed into the AST. So I'm parsing the code that calls the macro. And you can see something interesting uh, on the right, which is that you can see that it's pretty big. You can see that the code here was quite simple, a single line and not that long. And you can see that here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, level, maybe 10 uh, level of uh, imbrication. So this is... <coughs> This here is actually, let me move it so that you can see it uh, in its entirety. This here is the reason why uh, Swift macros are hard. It's because Swift macros operate on this kind of code and produce this kind of code. And this AST is a very hard uh, piece of code to handle. 
mostly because it's something that was meant and that is meant to implement compilers, not to implement app level code like we're used to. So if you're used to writing code that fetches an API, display data on a screen, shows a form, sends some data back to another API, this is uh, definitely, most definitely, something very, very, very different. By the way, I just gave a look to my streaming software and uh, since I'm streaming to Twitter, uh, Twitter X, uh, YouTube and LinkedIn, I see there is 128 viewers, which is like an absolute uh, record. I don't think I've ever uh, went higher than 50 or maybe 60. 128 is really a lot and I'm glad that nothing has crashed. The feature seems to be working very uh, well. So congrats to the people who made Ecamm Live, which is the software that I use uh, to stream. Let's go back to uh, the topic of Swift macros. So we are back into Xcode, and now let's have a look at how the macro is implemented. First thing that's done is that the macro looks at the argument list in the node. So what's interesting is that if we go back to the AST, we can see that uh, we might be able to see the argument list. Where is it? So actually the argument list is the arguments that are passed here uh, to Stringify. It's not explicitly mentioned as such, but I'm going to show you just after a way that you can uh, get this information uh, interactively when you write the macro. So it gets the argument list. So the argument list is this. Then it gets the first argument. Interestingly, you can see that if there isn't, the macro will throw an error. But if there is more than one, it won't throw an error. So we'll try this case just after. But uh, just to show you that with macros, uh, there is no uh, magic. Every error has to be implemented. And you will see that when you implement a macro, it's often more challenging to implement the error cases than to implement the happy path. But it's also sometimes and even most of the times, even more important than to implement the happy path because a macro that doesn't work reliably or that has errors that are incomprehensible, uh, your user will not use it because it will be so frustrating that they will just drop uh, using it. So it takes the argument and then it returns some new <coughs> source code. So you can see the function it needs to return an exp syntax, but it returns a string. That's because exp syntax conforms, um, so not directly here, but somewhere, uh, exp syntax conforms to the protocol expressible by string literal, which allows you to return a string which contains Swift source code that will be parsed automatically. This way you don't have to manually construct the AST uh, piece by piece, which makes it a little bit simpler. And you can see that it returns uh, Swift code that contains a tuple. The first element of the tuple in the Swift code is the expression that was passed into as an argument. And the second part is the value of the argument turned into a string by using this custom string interpolation. And we're going to run this code just after to see it uh, in action. And finally, here we have the main, so the entry point of this uh, package. <coughs> And the entry point, its job is simply uh, to say what are the macros that this uh, package exposes. So it says it exposes the stringify macro. This way you can you have control over which macros are implemented. You could maybe implement some internal macros and not expose them. One thing I find interesting here is that Swift uh, has made a choice of calling macros Swift macros. Even though the more you look at them, the more you see, as I was saying, that they are compiler uh, level, uh, compiler level code. And here I find it funny that it's the part where it spills the beans. It just says, okay, a macro actually, it's a compiler plugin. And the name is carrier, but seeing here being named as a compiler plugin, I find it to be like a source of relief because you're like, okay, this is hard. We are in compiler territory. We are not in regular, uh, in regular source code uh, territory. So that's why I wanted to, to highlight it. We've covered two of the targets were created. Now let's move on to the next one. So it's this one. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little bit a uh, small thing in my, uh, in my throat. So this is now the fourth, uh, the third out of four targets, URL macro client. So what's the job of URL macro client? It's an executable target. You can see it basically as a command line tool. It's kind of like a playground, uh, but just it's run as a, as a command line tool. So all of the code at the top level gets uh, executed when you run it. 
And its job is that it's not something that you will import in your project. It's just a way to test uh, the macro, but in the same condition than when it will be used uh, by an actual project in the sense that all of the levels of abstraction are being implemented and respected. So you can see that you import the URL macro, so which is the public header. And when, it will, when the macro will be run, it will be run with all of the level of uh, encapsulation and isolation uh, at compile time. So it's a way to test your macro with the exact same working condition than when it will be actually used by actual users into their own projects. So here you can see we're testing the stringify macro. So we have two variables A and B, stringify A plus B. And normally here, this should contain the result of the expression. So if I still remember how to count, this should be uh, 42. And the code, it should be the expression here. So a string containing A, white space plus white space B. So let's run this code and see what's going to happen. So I need to run URL macro client. And normally we should see in the console the result. So let me pull up the console for this. You can see it takes a bit of time to, to build. This is one of the downside of using Swift macros is that since you use Swift syntax and it's a package that takes a lot of time uh, to build because it's basically uh, some compiler tool chain, you will experience that your project will take a bit of time to, uh, to run. And it seems it's the first time that I'm, running, uh, that I'm running a macro on this version of Xcode on this computer. So you can see that the value was 42 produced by the code uh, that, that is in this string. So A white space plus white space B. Something that's very useful when you're using a macro is that you can do a right click expand macro and it's going to show you the source code that the call of the macro evaluates to. So here what's happening is that this here replaces the call of the macro. This is exactly uh, what's happening. No more and no less. You can see that it also shows, uh, but not explicitly, so I will explicit it. One of the fundamental ways that macro work is that a macro can only add uh, new things to the source code. It can never modify existing source code and it can never uh, delete existing source code. This has two advantages. First, it makes it so that macros are much more predictable because otherwise, if a macro could remove a piece of your code or change it uh, from under you, that could be quite weird. It could also be potentially a security issue. Imagine a macro that does a really nice thing, but also replaces a URL by a proxy that's going to sniff all of your network uh, code. That would be a, a big problem. So it's much easier uh, in all aspects. And also because macros are strictly additive, uh, it makes it uh, it makes the order in which the macros are called way less important. And that's also a big advantage when your macros are being uh, executed. Once again, it makes them uh, easier to, uh, to reason about. Um, what else did I want to show you? Oh, yes, I wanted to show you like errors. So for instance, if the macro is called without an argument, you can see. What's interesting is that here you can see we get an error, but it's not the error that was defined in the implementation because this implementation was this error. Actually, it was not throwing an error. It was showing a fatal error. And that's interesting to show because what's happening is that the error here is not being called by this code because this code is not even being run. The error is being called because the signature of the public API of the macro is not being respected. So you have this first level of validation when your macro is being executed in its production context. You will see just after why I say in its production context. So we can uh, just put the code just like it was. And if I put one more uh, argument, you can see we also get an error because this also doesn't respect the signature declared here where there is only one argument. Once again, you will see that it's not always the case depending on where you use the macro. And where it's not always the case is in the last target, the one I haven't yet covered. So the testing target. So this target right here. So it's the target that tests, uh, that tests your macro. So the good news is that testing the macro is quite easy because since, as I was telling you, a macro is a strictly like uh, additive process, it means when you think about it that a macro is actually what's called in computer science a pure function. So a pure function is a function that is entirely determined 
uh, it's a function whose return value is entirely determined by its arguments. So to say it otherwise, for the same uh, arguments, the function should always return the same value and have no side effects whatsoever. So it shouldn't read any value outside of the arguments and it shouldn't change any value outside of the arguments. And when you have a pure function, one of the consequences, one of the nice consequences of being a pure function is that pure functions are very easy to test because since they have this deterministic property, you just need to say what here is the entry, here's the expected output, and the test is well making sure that the actual out output uh, ma ma matches the expected output. And you can see that's how the tests are being implemented. It says, okay, assert that this code right here expands into this uh, source code. I see a great question. Can it do random? Because yes, after all, uh, doing random, so taking a random number, it's a side effect because the random, I mean, not, that depends on how you implement it. Let me, uh, let me actually correct, uh, correct what I'm saying. And by the way, I'm realizing that I'm uh, not at the right place in the, in the frame. So let me move also a bit before. So a random number, you ask it to give you a new uh, a random number generator, you ask it to give you a new, a new random number. Okay, uh, sorry, I just need to move the frame because just not that I'm well positioned, but it means that I'm hiding more code than I should. So that would be better that way, that way. So a random number generator, you ask it for a new random number each time, but it has to be initialized. It has to be given a seed. Most of the time, that seed is going to be derived by some runtime value. It could be the timestamp, uh, the current timestamp. It could be uh, some values from the state of the CPU. It could be like uh, using the movements of the cursor in uh, the past five seconds. There are several ways to do it. I'm not sure which one Swift uses, but all of these ways to proceed have one thing in common is that they are actually a side effect uh, in this case because they read a value that is outside of the arguments of the, of the function. So indeed, uh, pulling a random number, you are not respecting how a macro should behave. Same thing if you use the current date, uh, for instance, inside of a macro. So you want to be careful uh, about that. You want to be careful. And uh, if you really need to have randomness into your macro, I guess what I would recommend is uh, do your research and make sure that um, you do it the right way. Maybe ask a question or search on the Swift forums for this specific topic, but I would make sure that you get it right because otherwise it can lead to some uh, very, uh, very weird things. But I guess that there are ways where it could make sense uh, to have something random for the macro to be, uh, to be used. Same thing for bool.random. Uh, I mean, Yes, you could do it. I'm not sure that's what a macro should be, uh, should be used for, um, to be honest. But I mean, yes, I mean, you... Oh, you raise an extremely good point. You raise an extremely good, good point. Because when I say you cannot use random in a macro, let's be very clear about what I mean. I mean that the code that implements the macro shouldn't use randomness or any kind of side effect. However, the code returned by the macro is allowed to use whatever it needs. So you can return Swift code that uses bool.random, for instance. There is no problem with that. Where there is a problem is that would be if you use bool.random in the way that your macro is implemented. And that's a great question that you asked because it allows me to uh, highlight the fact that I didn't say it explicitly, but inside a macro, you find two different kinds of source code, of Swift code, rather, you have the Swift code that executes the macro and you have the Swift code that is returned by the macro. And even though there are two pieces of Swift code, they live in very different realms and they are not subject to the same properties. The Swift code that runs the macro is run at compile time locally. The Swift code returned by the macro is run at runtime uh, when the project or when the code, when the app is executed. So it's two very different pieces of code and the same rules don't apply to uh, the two. So to say it differently, here, bool.random in the macro, probably not great. Uh, bool.random in the code generated by the macro, there is no problem because it's valid Swift code and the macro can do uh, whatever valid Swift code you need to do. So thank you for asking these questions because they allowed me to mention this fact that I had forgotten to mention.
So back to the test, we can see that we say for this, this test, we use this method, this function rather assert, uh, is it a method or a function? Let's see. It's a function. Uh, assert macro expansion, and we want to assert that this expands into this. And we can see here we pass macros. Why do we pass macros? You can see that here we have this little dictionary which maps the name of a macro with its implementation. Kind of similar to what we had here. And the reason we have this is because, remember, I told you that macros run in isolation. That's very nice when you run production code. That's a problem when you run tests, because when you run tests, you want your test, uh, uh, you want the code that you test to run in the same process than your testing code. This way, it makes everything way easier. When that's not the case, things get really complica complicated and complex. Uh, one typical example of a testing process where the testing code doesn't run into the same process than the code being tested is when you implement UI tests for iOS. Your iOS app runs in its own process, your testing code in another process, and the way that you make the two uh, talk through each other is through the accessibility layer, and it's not the best uh, ergonomics. So that's why for macros, there is actually a little like... Uh, uh, how should I call it? I don't know. I, I don't find the, the correct uh, the correct word, but it's like a, a bypass in a way, in the sense that the public declaration of the macro is completely bypassed by the test, and instead you have just the minimal way of doing the link between the name of the macro and its implementation, which is this dictionary right here. It also means that when you write your test, the live the type checking that is done. By the, by the compiler, when you call the macro, we saw it here, for instance, if I were to add a second argument, it would really lead into a completion error. This kind of error will not be caught during, uh, during the test because the public API is not used. This can be a little bit uh, weird. It can feel weird. It can feel weird. It might even make you feel that your tests are unreliable. That's not the case because what it means is that the testing code can test some behavior that cannot happen uh, in production code. So in that sense, it's not a problem. It's not a problem because it's not that you cannot test things that could happen, it's that you can test uh, things that cannot happen. So in that case, it just means that you can write tests for a, a super set of the possible behavior. So it's not a problem. The other way around would have been a problem because it means that there are some actual use cases that you cannot uh, write tests for. Fortunately, it's uh, it's the other way around, so it's not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem at all. But once again, this shows that macros are quite complex. I'm looking at the time. We are almost 40 minutes in, and I'm still not done uh, covering all of the basics of what a macro is. That shows you how complex it is. I don't think there is another uh, concept in Swift that takes so long just to show the basics, what you get when you create the default, uh, the default template. By the way, I'm looking at the numbers again. This time, we are more than 200 uh, viewers. So you know what? I'm going to... I wanted to make a screenshot uh, of it. I'm going to make a quick screenshot of it so that I have a memory of it. Once again, absolute record. Thank you for being um, so many. And I hope that this live is uh, being useful to you. Uh, I guess it is. I saw some nice messages in, uh, in, uh, in the chat. And uh, don't worry, we've almost finished uh, the discovery of how a macro works. And then we will be able to move to implementing our own macro. So these are the tests. You can see the expansion. Uh, so the macro being expanded into actual source code. Let me run the test just to see that they are indeed green, and then I'm going to try and change them a bit just to show you uh, the kind of errors that can, uh, can happen. So the tests are green. So let's see what happens if, for instance, I pass no arguments. Normally, what it should do is that it should trigger here the fatal error. And I'm putting a breakpoint so that we can see if we enter indeed uh, this... Uh, this code path. So let me run this test again. Okay, we are indeed entering this, uh, this, um, this code path. Now let's try and pass more than one argument. 
So here we are testing for something that for something that cannot happen in production because the compiler would catch it. But what should happen is that the test actually should be green because there is nothing in the source code that prevents it. We might want to test for this if we wanted to, even though it's not necessary because the public API of the macro, which has uh, type constraints, uh, would implement this actually for us. But I'm just re-implementing it, re it just to show you a simple example of how to change the implementation of, uh, of a macro. So we could say, so we have this here. We could also say uh, guard uh, node dot argument list uh, dot count equal equal one. Else, I'm doing a, a fatal error again just for simplicity. And it would be uh, compiler bug. Uh, the macro received more than uh, one argument. I see a great suggestion uh, for writing a more complex test. We're going to try it just after. So normally now, uh, here the test should no longer be passing because this will not expand into this. And indeed, you can see that it's that it has triggered the fatal error. So perfect. Let me put the code back to how it was. So now I see some. I see that you're suggesting to say, okay, a plus B plus C. So normally, A plus B plus C, we agree that it should lead to this. So let's try to run the test. Yes, the test passes perfectly. Let's also try minus. And minus should also work. And so the tests are perfectly implemented. Perfect. One last thing I wanted to show you uh, is how you can have helped to know that here, for instance, you should query the argument list. One way to do that is to put a breakpoint into the implementation of your macro. It might still be a bit empty, but you're putting a breakpoint. You've also written a test for your macro. This way you can run your macro, but in a way where, the, where you can trigger breakpoints, because when you trigger the macro from uh, the client, breakpoints will not be triggered because then the macro will run in its own separate process. But from the test, the breakpoint will be triggered. So I'm running my test. My breakpoint is here. And in the console, you can see that here I have arguments. And I can try and do, for instance, a PO arguments. And you can see it shows me what's inside the argument. So let me move it a bit, you can see that there is an infix operator expression syntax. So if A plus B is an infix operation. There is a left operand with an identifier, which is A. Then there is a binary operator minus, because I updated the test just before, and a right operand with, uh, with, the, with uh, the identifier B. And so if I wanted to go deeper in how the macro operates into the content of the argument, I could do it uh, by handling uh, these, uh, these types, which uh, are what the expression was parsed into once turned into a portion of abstract syntax tree. And I think now we've covered the basics. It only took us 40 minutes, 43 minutes. Now we've covered the basics and we are ready to actually start implementing our own uh, macro. So I'm going to do a little bit of a cleanup. I'm going to remove uh, the code that was uh, already there. So I'm going to remove this code here. I'm going to remove that code there. Uh, here, I'm going to remove everything uh, here. I'm still keeping, um, keeping the, the, the part here because it's going to be an expression macro. Um, no, you know what? Let's remove everything and let's rewrite everything from scratch this way. It will be, uh, it will be uh, more interesting. Okay, here I'm removing this. And uh, here, so we'll have to implement this. And the test of the macro, I'm just going to keep one test. And we will need also to re-implement it. Okay. Now let's actually uh, implement, uh, implement the macro. So... I'm going to first start by writing the code that um, how I would like to use the macro. The way I would like to use the macro would be to do something like this. 
So we're going to implement the macro pound URL. And what I would like is that I pass it a string. And if it's a string that matches, that parses correctly as a URL, it just keeps on building. And if it's not the case, it uh, returns a compilation error, like the one you saw in the thumbnail of the live stream that would say, uh, this is not a correctly formed URL. For instance, if I pass in this string, I would like to have a compile time uh, error. So let's implement this macro. First thing we need to do is to implement the public API of the macro. So we've seen that we need to use the keyword macro for this. Then we give the name of the macro. So it's URL because I want to call it by doing pound URL. So here the name of the macro is just like the name of, uh, of a function. Then I need to define the argument list of that macro. So here it's going to be a string literal. So the macro is going to take a string literal uh, as an uh, uh, argument. I never remember if literal takes only one or two uh, T and R, but it seems to be correct. Perfect. The argument will be of type string. And what will uh, the macro return? It will return a URL. And you can see it's not going to return an optional URL like with the initializer of URL, of URL. Rather, it will return a normal URL because the case where the URL would be nil will be mapped to a compilation error. There's also an interesting way to see this macro. You can see it as a function that instead of mapping uh, all of its inputs to return values, it will map some of its inputs, the non-valid inputs, to compilation error. If you want to think in terms of function theory, uh, it's kind of a way to, uh, to see it. Just like some function that throw will map some of their input to, uh, to an error being thrown, here it will map some possible inputs, the inputs uh, which are strings, which are not valid URLs, it will map them to a compilation error. Then we need to uh, first give this macro uh, its role. So here, nothing changes. It's still going to be a freestanding macro. We're going to call it with the pound sign. And it's one that is going to return an expression because we pass it a string. It returns a URL. And a URL, it's an expression because uh, I would say because it's not a declaration, and I guess it's still correct because I guess in Swift, no, it's not correct. In Swift, like there is more, you have expressions, you have declarations, you also have instructions like an if statement, for instance. Uh, even though now you can also use if statements as uh, expressions, so it's not a good example. Uh, a for loop, for instance, is purely uh, an instruction. Uh, but a macro, a freestanding macro, can be either expression or declaration, and it's not a declaration, it's an expression, it's something to, that evaluates uh, to a value that we can then either uh, pass as an argument, assign to a, a property, all the things that you can do in Swift with an expression. Now we need to say how the macro is implemented, or rather where it is implemented, the how will come uh, later. So for that we use external macro, and then for the module, so the module you can see it's called URL macro uh, macros. I'm going to keep the same name. It's not the best name, but I don't want to start renaming and potentially making subtle errors that will take me time to, uh, to debug while I'm live. So I'm going to keep with uh, this uh, not perfect, but working naming convention. And the type will be URL macro. So I will need to define a type, most probably a struct, inside the package URL macro macros that will be called URL macro. All right. Good news is that uh, we've uh, almost implemented the declaration uh, of the public API of the macro. You can see one thing is missing is that URL is not found because URL is part of foundation. And so you need to explicitly import foundation because your macro depends on, from, on, on foundation because it uses as its, as its return type uh, the type URL, which is defined inside foundation. So we've done the easy part. Now let's do the harder part, which is to actually implement the macro. Of course, for me, I have the finished code uh, in front of me. So uh, it's going to be a bit easier. But I'm going to show you how to implement it in a very like interactive way, just like if I was starting from scratch. So first thing, I need to uh, define my struct that I'm going to call URL macro. <coughs> 
and it's going to conform to the protocol expression macro. I need to implement the requirement of this protocol. So let me add protocol stubs. So it's this method. So it's just the one that we have implemented before. So expansion of node in context. I'm just going to remove the prefixing by Swift syntax uh, by the name of the package because it will still work without them and uh, it will just have us uh, help us have um, a code that is a bit cleaner. Okay. You can see that this struct only contains a static function. So actually, I could turn it into an enum. It would be slightly more correct because this way it would convey the fact that you cannot instantiate uh, the, the struct or rather it doesn't make sense to instantiate it. Using either is honestly uh, pretty much the, the same thing here. And if you look at macros implemented by the iOS community, you will see that they tend to use struct or enum uh, indifferently, uh, honestly. It doesn't make a real difference since the struct is not visible anywhere. I mean, it's not usable anywhere outside this package. You can use uh, you can use either, but if you like using uh, enums, if you like using enums to define this kind of type that cannot be instantiated uh, in Swift, you are free to do so. So of course, we need to also declare the fact that this uh, macro is exposed uh, to the outside world. So we do it by adding the type of the macro, the meta type of the macro to the providing macro uh, property uh, set at the, at the entry point. And then we can actually start implementing the macro. So where do we start? I'm going to try to do what I had said before, which is to put a breakpoint and start a test uh, a text uh, a test and we'll see what happens in order to be able to do that i still need to return something so i'm just going to return um, to return an uh, empty piece of code just so that this file uh, will build then inside the test so first i need to make the link between uh, the name of the macro and its type so it's going to be url macro.self so i'm basically making saying when I use this uh, macro identifier in the code I pass to the function assert macro expansion, it is mapped to this implementation. And then let's write, uh, let's write the first, uh, a first test actually. For instance, uh, the test I would like uh, to write is that, so uh, if I write this source code, so pound URL and then, for instance, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash Swift dot org slash. So which is a valid uh, URL. Uh, normally, this should evaluate to calling this time the init of URL in foundation. Uh, I had forgotten to put the ending quote here. Let me just copy paste. And you can see I'm going to force unwrap. We'll see it just after why it's okay to force unwrap uh, in that case. But the thing is, this is what is the expected uh, expanded source code. So let's just run uh, the test and let's see what's going to happen. We can see that there is a problem here. So I'm just going to re... Uh, I wanted to run the test, but for some reason, if the client doesn't compile, the test uh, don't want to run. So I've commented out the code. Let's rerun it again. Okay, so we can see that we have a problem because uh, this time it didn't return anything. So indeed, that's a, that's a problem. I would have liked it to trigger this breakpoint. Oh, but I had disabled it by mistake. That's why it wasn't called. So let me run the test again. Now that the breakpoint is enabled, uh, we are running, uh, we, the breakpoint has been triggered and I can try to do uh, PO node. So when you do PO node, uh, it can be frustrating because you get this error, which is telling you basically, uh, cannot find node in, uh, in scope. Don't worry, uh, there is a trick to fix it. And it's, it's just that I found that this error only happens when you query the node directly, but not when, when you query uh, what the node, you can see even this is not going to work. But once you've gotten a first piece of, uh, of data outside of the node, then you can use the trick I showed you just before. So 
let's get the first piece of data and we've seen how to do it because it's what uh, the, the macro uh, stringify used to do. But before we do that, actually, I want to lay out uh, the outline of how we're going to implement the macro. And we're going to do it into three parts. And you will see that it's often the way that macros are implemented. The first part is that we're going to parse uh, the AST we receive as an input. So what we get here for this argument, we're going to parse it in order to extract the data that we need to operate on. Here it will be getting the string literal that was passed as an argument to the macro pound URL. We might want to also check some preconditions. For instance, here we're going to want to check that it's a static string, meaning that there is no string uh, interpolation being done inside of it. Then once this is done, we're going to want to run uh, the macros logic. Here it's going to be checking uh, that the string passed as an argument is indeed a valid URL. And you will see that often the second step is the easiest one. And the first step, which is which will be to return uh, returning a new AST or new Swift code, which is the Swift code that the macro will produce. And usually, step one is the hardest, step three is easier, and step two tends to be the easiest because at this point you already have all of your data in basic uh, regular Swift variable, and it's just running. Uh, logic, which is not harder than running app-level code. So the reason why it's easier is because it's the part where the code looks like what we have been accustomed to. And part one and three are the ones when, where it's completely new. So let's remember how do we get the argument. We did it just before, so or rather it was done for us just before, so it's going to be, actually it's even suggested, you can get the argument list by doing node.argumentList, and if there is no argument, let's actually throw an error. So you can use either fatal error or you can throw an error. It's better to throw an error than use fatal error. And in order to throw an error, I'm going to copy paste the code for a very useful type. It's custom error, so it's a type that conforms to error. And you can see that you can pass it a message that will be displayed uh, as uh, the compiler error in Xcode. So this is just what we can do here, uh, throw uh, instead of fatal error. So we're going to do throw custom error dot message. And here it will be, the error will be uh, no argument. We now managed to write it correctly. No argument passed to macro pound URL. Notice that this uh, situation should not be able to happen in production or rather cannot happen in production because the declaration of the macro expects one argument of type string, and if we don't uh, honor this, the compiler will fail the compilation and it will not reach the point where it calls the implementation of the macro. We will have a failure before in the compilation uh, workflow. But still, I'm writing it here just to show you a simple use case of how to throw an error when there is a problem. So let me put a breakpoint back right here and let me run the test again. Because now we have a new uh, local variable to query, which is rather, oh, so it did let argument list equal argument list, but actually I want the argument itself. And so it should be the first element of, uh, of that list. Let me run the test once more. This time the build was successful. And so now that I have this argument value here, I can try and do PO argument. And you can see now, we see what we have. We have an expression inside the argument, and then we have a string literal syntax inside of it. So we can, uh, we can use this, then we can do let, um, let uh, expression, for instance, and it will be argument dot expression, because we saw that there is an expression stored Inside the uh, inside the argument, and then what we want to do to get is to get uh, the segments. So the segments it's the number of um, of uh, of uh, of portions of string that there is in the string passed as an argument. This sounds confusing, but you need to have segments uh, inside a string when you have string interpolation because you could have several uh, segments in a string and they need to be 
compiled uh, differently. But what we want in our case is to only allow for static strings, so strings that do not use string interpolation. And so we want to make sure that there is only uh, one segment into a uh, one segment into our uh, our um, our string uh, string literal. So what we do then is that we're going to do let segments equal expression dot or rather what we need to do is that we need to cast the uh, expression into a string literal exp syntax. So why do we need to do that? Because this is a type that we have at runtime, but it could be a different time, uh, a different type. Uh, it could possibly be a different type because this is the argument we are given. And this argument here, it's a string literal uh, exp syntax because we passed in a string, but we could have passed in also an integer. And then I guess it would have been something like an integer literal exp syntax. So since it can sometimes be a string literal exp syntax, but not always, we need to add one condition to our guard, which is to make sure that it's, uh, which is to make sure that, uh, sorry, uh, which is to make sure that we are in the case where it's a string literal exp syntax because we only operate on string anyways. So here I have an error because this, uh, this one right here uh, can be something else than an expression. Uh, or rather, no, sorry, this is not an optional, so I cannot do a guardlet here. So what I will do is that I will do the full guardlet at this level right here. This way here, I have the expression inside my argument. And then here I can do another guardlet segments, and it will be the expression and to cast it. So we could imagine using the as question mark operator, but actually Swift syntax exposes a method, a helper method called as, so it's the same logic. You just pass uh, the type as an argument. It also returns an optional. So it really behaves, it behaves the same way as, as question mark. It's just a different syntax that Swift syntax prefers for some reason. To be honest, I'm not sure of the reason why. But now we can get the segments because segments are only defined in the case where you have a string literal X syntax uh, for the argument. So now we have the segments. So actually I can remove this code right here. So we can add another condition to make sure that the segments count is equal to one. So that the string only contains one segment. So there is no string interpolation inside of it. And finally, we can extract uh, the actual data. And so we do that by doing case string segment. So a string segment is the type for a segment of a string literal x that contains a string in our case because we are only dealing with uh, static strings that's what contains the, te the text for instance i guess it would have been a different type it would have been a different type if i had used um, a string interpolation so inside of this we have uh, the literal segment okay so you can see this is the part where uh, it's really hard to write a macro. When I was saying it's closer to compiler level code, this is some kind of compiler level code. So if this feels confusing to you, uh, don't be ashamed by it. It's a very, very complex uh, process. I'm not going to pretend that uh, I can write uh, this, um, that I can write this, um, this code by memory. Uh, I, I use the version made by Apple. Uh, I don't know how to write this kind of code uh, just like that. So don't worry if, you're, uh, if you find yourself not being able to do it. It's perfectly normal. I see a really, really great question in the chat. So I'm going to answer it. Can't you use static string uh, moving so that we can see it better? Can't you use static string to ensure that there are no interpolation? That is a great question because the answer is yes. But also what we are doing is arguably better. So the question is, why didn't I use static uh, string here? Static string is a special type. And when you use it, the compiler guarantees that the, that the code that you use is that the string you pass is static in the sense that it's entirely defined at compile time. There is no part of the string that is going to be defined at runtime. In a way, 
And in a conceptual way, I'm not saying that it's what's happening under the hood, but in a way, static string is similar to a macro that would run what we've implemented here in the sense that you could imagine implementing a macro called static string. It would take as an argument a string, and if you use string interpolation, it would return false. Otherwise, it would return true. This, uh, this kind of thing, because this is basically what we've been implementing. So I would say, yes, you could use static string. However, when you use static string in your code, maybe I, I think it is going to impose some restrictions on, uh, on your code because you, you will not be able to pass all of the values that you would like directly, or maybe you will need to convert them into a static string. So it might bring um, some extra constraints on your code base. However, However, you can not define this constraint at the level of the signature of the macro. And what you can do, since you're running code that operates over uh, Swift code and that has the same power than uh, in checking how the code is structured than the compiler, you can run this check inside the macro. So the macro is checking that it's a static string, but it's doing it without uh, having us needing to use the type static string, which arguably gives a higher amount of flexibility because now you can pass in any string and you don't need to deal with, the, with jumping through the specific hoops of having to turn uh, an existing string into a static string. So it's a very good, uh, very good question, uh, very good question, very good remark because it highlights one of the power of uh, macros, which is that when you implement a macro, you can implement really any kind of check that you would like over the structure of the source code and including stuff that before could only be achieved by implementing some specific type that the compiler or the language had put there for you. Before macros, you didn't have a way to test to ensure that a string was static other than using static string. Now you have more ways to do it, which gives you uh, arguably more flexibility. So thank you for this question because it was uh, a really, really great question. And I'm seeing that it's at 289 viewers, so almost 300. Like these numbers are amazing. Like, for, you know, for me in France, it's 9 p.m. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to go to, to, go, to get some sleep afterwards. I'm going to be so excited and so tired tomorrow. But uh, this, is, uh, this is absolutely amazing. I'm so glad I tried to stream on all platforms this time. But let's get back. Uh, let's get back to it. So string segment, perfect. I'm going to move the code a bit so that it's easier to read. And um, now we need to just change the error message because it needs to reflect that it is thrown when one of these conditions uh, didn't uh, evaluate to, uh, to, uh, to true. So here the error message would be to say that found URL requires a static string literal. Arguably, you might want to split it, for instance, to say, okay, there was no argument, there was more than one argument, even though it cannot, uh, it cannot happen. Uh, but in a way, this message error still encompasses this full scope. You need to have one argument, and it needs to be a static string uh, literal. Now, what do you do once you have this uh, literal segment, so the content of the string? You can run the macros logic. And running the macros logic, I was telling you, it's uh, usually the easiest part. You will see I wasn't lying. How do we test that a macro, that a string is a valid URL? It's extremely easy. We call the init of URL that takes a string as an argument. We pass the literal segment, or rather we pass its content and the text of its content to actually get a string. And we check. Is this different of, of nil? That's the basic way to do it. It's as simple as that. You might be tempted to implement some kind of complex regex, but you don't need to because since you're running Swift code, you can use foundation. You just need to import it. So let me import it. You can run foundation and you can use all of the code that you have in foundation. You could use formatters if you wanted. You can really use all of the Swift code that's available to you as long as it doesn't uh, perform side effects, remember. So here, a way to test that the string passed as an argument to the macro is a valid string is simply, is a valid URL, sorry, is simply to pass it to the init of URL that takes in a string and to say, all right, 
guard let underscore equal. So meaning we want to make sure that this is not nil. Uh, doing this syntax here is actually, you know what? I had written it like that, but actually for clarity's sake, I removed too much code. For clarity's sake, uh, I would say it's better to write it uh, like this. I think it's much more uh, explicit that way. What do we do? If this is not the case, so if this return nil, which means that this was not a valid URL, then we are going to very happily throw a compilation error to let the user know that this is not a valid URL. And so there is no way that it's going to be successfully parsed at runtime because it has failed to parse at compile time. So we've moved the check once again. We, I was saying earlier that the macro, it mapped some of the inputs to a compilation error. Also, we can say that it, it moved uh, this check that maybe was in your apps before. It moved it from runtime code to compile time code with the added level of uh, safety that it brings with it. And so we're going to pass in an error, which will be to say malformed uh, URL. And then we just pass in the argument. So we print it so that the user knows what has happened. And finally, last part, we need to return the Swift code that the macro will produce. And it's actually quite easy. We just need in the Swift code to call the init string and to pass it the argument. So we take the argument that was passed to the macro. We pass it to, um, to the string. You can notice I don't need to put double quotes because the argument already includes the double quotes. Uh, Actually, can you actually see it? Uh, you can't really see it uh, that way, but I think, yes, we could see it. Yes, we could see, see it in when I printed. I had uh, the expression, and then you can see there were the opening quotes, the segments, and the closing quotes that were, that were included. So, we return this code, so I just need to close uh, the parenthesis, and I need to do a force unwrap because I'm going to force unwrap my result, but it's okay to do it because just before I have checked that uh, indeed it doesn't return nil. And since URL uh, string is uh, deterministic in the sense that when you give it the same argument, it produces the same result, I have the guarantee that since I have checked this condition at compile time, then uh, this other piece of code will work correctly at runtime. It might seem weird uh, when you uh, write this kind of code for the first time. It might even seem a bit, uh, a bit uh, unsafe. I just look at the numbers. We have passed 300 uh, viewers, 300 concurrent viewers. This is amazing. Once again, I'm making a screenshot because I just, uh, I just have to do it at this point. But that's uh, that's quite a, quite a huge number. The only downside technically is that in the chat, by the way, in the chat, I only see uh, messages from YouTube. So if you've been writing messages in the chat uh, on LinkedIn and uh, on, uh, on Twitter, I don't see them and I am so, so, so sorry about, uh, about it. But I just uh, don't see them. There might be something, uh, something wrong. So if I haven't answered you, it's not that I don't want you. It's just that I haven't seen them and I'm so sorry about it if that's indeed uh, the case. Let's get back to it. So I was saying this might seem a little bit unsafe when you write code this way, but I can tell you that it's actually, it's exactly what the compiler already does. For instance, when you use optional, the compiler checks at compile time that you're using optional like you should. And if you're using it like you should, then at runtime, at some point, what's going to happen is that memory is read somewhere um, in, the, in, the, in the memory space of your app. And uh, it's guaranteed that it will run correctly because the compiler has performed the check at compile time that indeed at this memory address, there must be a valid value and it's not possible that there is something else. So this feels a bit, uh, a bit weird because it feels like, okay, we've checked right now that it works, but what kind of guarantee do we have that it will work uh, later? Actually, we do have that guarantee because this function is deterministic. So there is nothing to be, uh, to be scared uh, about. But you know, like 
I'm making an analogy, but it's kind of like the first time that you learn how to do programming, maybe you will do, okay, you have like uh, let a equal uh, three, for instance, and then, uh, no, rather, let a equal int dot uh, random, something like that. And then you do, all right, if a uh, is a multiple of two, you write some code. And then you need to do else, but maybe you're thinking, huh, am I sure that the compiler is actually uh, really doing uh, the else correctly? Shouldn't it be like uh, more prudent if I were to do like, if is multiple of two uh, equal equal false? Because you feel like, can I really trust the else uh, to work correctly? Well, the answer is yes, you should trust the, uh, the else because the else is enforced at compiler level, which is uh, heavily tested or rather more tested than, uh, than your own code is most of the time for most of compilers. I have no doubt that the Swift compiler is more tested than uh, the projects I've been, uh, I've been working on. And so it's much better to use the else which is heavily tested and guaranteed to be reliable rather than to write your own uh, code like this where you have a lot of chances of making uh, additional mistakes. The analogy is not perfect, but if you, if you were like uh, having issues understanding this kind of way of like, should we trust the compiler or not? I think this might be an interesting, uh, interesting uh, analogy. Uh, let me remove this code because if I leave it, it's just going to be confusing in addition of breaking uh, the way that my macro is going to work. So actually, you know what? Now I should be able to go back to my test and I should be able to run my test and the test should be green. Perfect, the test is green. So that's amazing. The macro has been successfully implemented, it seems. So let's try to use it. So I'm gonna run this code. I wanted to show the, the, good, the good use case first. So let me, uh, let me put it like this. You didn't see anything. Uh, so. Oh, I have an error, it is very interesting. The macro was successful. Uh, however, the macro expanded to this code and this code is not valid Swift code in my file because I need to import foundation. So this is something to keep in mind. A macro might generate code that requires you to import uh, other, uh, other packages. So it's an interesting thing that we saw this, uh, this uh, situation happen. So we can see that this time the macro uh, checked that this was a valid URL and since it was the case, then it replaced uh, the call of the macro with this. So once again, this here was replaced with this. That's what the macro did in addition to running some, uh, some tests. And now let's test the other use case. So with a bad URL, so I'm just going to add some white spaces like this. If I try to build, you can see we have the error that we wanted which has malformed URL and it shows us what the URL actually is. Also, by the way, if I were to do uh, here uh, a string interpolation, so like let extension equal, uh, it's a reserve keyword, so I need to do it like this, uh, come and here I do, uh, once again, I need to do it like this normally. It's not a static string uh, because I've put a string interpolation inside of it, so it also detected the error correctly. Let's remove, uh, let's remove this. And so you can see now we have this uh, error. And so what could have been, what would have before been a runtime error that happens on actual user devices has now been turned into a compile time error that not only we can catch, but we will need to catch and deal with because the project will not build until this error is here. And so as a result, our code has now become uh, much safer. So you can really see the interest of using uh, macros, this kind of macros, because they can add a level of safety to your source code. We've seen also that implementing a macro is definitely uh, quite a complex task because we still had to write this code and writing this code is uh, definitely not easy. We saw that you can use a breakpoint to help you a bit here. We also, uh, we can also have a look, let's have a look uh, in the uh, AST Explorer for uh, this code. You can see it does show us that we have the argument list then we have the labeled. It shows that we have the labeled expression list. 
And then we, we can see the string literal exp. So it's the type that we used uh, right, uh, right here. So I think if you really uh, start learning about writing macros and you really like deep dive into the topic, I think between putting breakpoints to uh, print out the content of the argument and also using the AST Explorer to look at what potential use case uh, parts into, you might get like uh, proficient after some point, but it's definitely no easy task. And it's not like writing a property wrapper where you can get started in 15, 20 minutes. Here, it's uh, really like a skill that, uh, that you would need to acquire. So one of the things I would like to take away from this live stream is that macros are hard. Uh, it's quite a rabbit hole. Uh, it's quite a, quite a rabbit hole. So don't go down into it if you're not sure that there is uh, some uh, value for you. I would say this kind of simple macro, like the pound URL macro, it's a great example where I think it's worth it. And honestly, I would recommend that you use this macro into your source code because it can save you uh, so much time. But if you have ideas for a more complex macro, think about the time it will take to write it. Think about the time it will take to maintain it. Think about the time it will take to write all of the error message because as I was saying earlier, writing the error message can often be more challenging than writing the actual happy path uh, for a macro. So you really want to keep this uh, in mind. And one last thing I wanted to show you for this live stream, it's, um, it's how to write a bit more tests. So you had two more uh, examples. One example was uh, when you have uh, an incorrect, uh, incorrect um, uh, macro uh, use case. So you want your test to make sure that the correct error is being, uh, is being uh, emitted. So I'm going to paste the code for this. So you can see, um, it's called test macros. So I'm saying assert macro expansion, and I want to assert that this is going to expand. So I'm keeping the same uh, source code. And here I'm saying that uh, it should emit this error. So it's called a diagnostic specification. And the message should be malform URL with uh, the URL passed as an argument. And I see it should happen on line one and on column 15. So line one is this one. And let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So it should happen on this uh, column here. So on the column where the, where the macro is actually being called. So it should say that basically the completion error happens here where I've selected uh, the pound character. So let's run this test and see if it's successful or not. So if it's the test is successful, it means that the error is indeed found correctly when we are uh, using this incorrect uh, use case. Oh, first I need to comment out this uh, invalid code because it blocks the project from building. We can see the test was successful. If I try to pass in an error message which is not correct, normally the test will fail. The test did fail, so it does check that the error message is indeed the correct one. Same thing if I change uh, the place where the error is being thrown. You can see that it also fails. So this shows that you can really write some, uh, some thorough tests for your macros and you should write some thorough tests for your macros because you really want to, uh, since it's a developer level uh, tool, you want to make sure that it works reliably because if, a macro, if your macro has bugs, which is of course possible because the macro is nothing but more than code, uh, a bug in a macro is kind of like a bug in the compiler. It's not something that, uh, that you want. Uh, I have memories of having to deal with a bug in the Swift compiler, which would make um, uh, the iOS app crash uh, at runtime in certain configuration. It's not fun at all. So you really want to, to write uh, some tests for your... Uh, for your macros. And sorry, I was hiding this message. So you can see it just said that it failed to uh, compare the, the columns. So I had written one and the value was 15. Um, all right. And one last thing I wanted to show you is uh, a test for the use case where uh, we would be passing uh, a URL with string interpolation. So like this one. So once again, I just need to use the correct uh, identifier here because I gave uh, the mapping of the macros a different name. And so let's run this to make sure that it works correctly. <laughs> 
What's interesting is that here it happens on... Uh, I'm just going to run everything because this test thing... Okay, yeah, it should be green because I switched the code back. I'm just... It's interesting that it... Oh, yes, I was about why does it happen on line 1 and not line 15 is because... Here I had the let invalid equal before and here I don't have it, so it makes sense. But just to show you uh, how this all works, if I put the if I put back the let uh, invalid like that and uh, like that, now if I run the code uh, the test again, it should be red because the colon is no longer the correct one. It's back to uh, colon fifteen. And so uh, now the test should be green. And if I run the test, all of the tests are green. Perfect. So I think that uh, concludes this live stream. Uh, let me show you the, the use case that we wanted so that we have this to illustrate while I finish the, the live stream. So that's all I wanted to show you. I still, you, are, you are still more than 300. You are 326. According to the counter, I can... Uh, I can see the counter I have when I open my eyes to quote what was said at the uh, at the Oscars uh, yesterday. That's amazing. That's an amazing number. I have never seen that number. I have never seen a number close to it uh, before. That I was saying it's usually like 50, 60 is already like a great number. So uh, thank you for being there. So many uh, this evening on YouTube, on Twitter, X and on uh, on LinkedIn. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, live stream. I really enjoy showing you this introduction to uh, macros, which can be quite uh, a daunting topic. And so if I've helped you get started with them, I'm happy. And if I've showed you also that macros are hard and you should not uh, go about implementing a macro without having thought it through in terms of how much it will ask you to dedicate in terms of time, energy, and resources, I will also be happy because it was also one of the goals of this live stream. Once again, if you ask messages in the chat on Twitter or on LinkedIn and I didn't answer, I'm so sorry, but they didn't appear on, uh, on my screen. So I will investigate this uh, later, but I'm sorry if I didn't answer you. Uh, if you were watching on YouTube and uh, you made great comments and answers uh, in the chat as you did, a big thank you uh, for you because, of course, it makes it much more interesting and interactive for me. It feels much less like I'm speaking uh, alone by myself uh, at home on the Monday evening. But also, there are many parts uh, during the live stream where I hadn't planned to speak about something, but there was a comment or a question or a remark in the chat that prompted me to do it. So thanks again, because these comments, these questions, these remarks, they helped me elevate the level of quality of the live stream, and I wouldn't have been able to do it uh, all on my, own, on my own. So thank you for this great uh, teamwork. And I think uh, I just have to say, well, once again, thank you all for uh, joining, and uh, see you probably, uh, probably next week for uh, another live stream. Bye-bye.